Welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. We are very pleased to have this lunchtime event with John Grisham. Thank you for joining us again. We have Michael Herman, the owner of Gibson's Bookstore, who is joining us in conversation to ask all of the burning questions of Mr. John Grisham. If you have questions, those of you tuning in from home, from the office, with your sandwiches, with your lunch, I know that we did have one person comment that they are actually logging in from Connecticut and their mother in Massachusetts and they're having lunch together while watching you, John. So that's a lot of fun. If you have questions that you would like us to ask, please do drop them in the chat sidebar or, or the Q&A. We will be asking audience questions in the latter part of the event. Um, but from that, welcome to Gibson's Bookstore. Michael, John, take it away. All right, super. Well, uh, John Grisham, thank you so much for joining us again today. Um, the last time we spoke, it was May 27th, and uh, Camino Wins uh, was on the top of the bestseller list, and now you have another book on top of the bestseller list. Does it ever, uh, does it ever get old? Well, for, first of all, Michael, thanks for having me again. Delighted to be back uh, at Gibson's, as always, and I just wish we could, you know, do a real book signing uh, non-virtually. Uh, but, no, it never gets old, uh, you know, debuting at number one it's always it's always uh, uh, a moment to celebrate even after all these books it's uh you know i work hard um in the in the winter and spring to write the book and finish it uh finish them in summer and then wait a few months for the publication and so uh it's you know the publication is always a uh very enjoyable and a lot of fun for me and to see the book well received early on is uh very gratifying yeah, I think I think so many readers are just glad to get back to the world of Jake and Clanton and Ford County and uh, you know, Ozzy. That you know, all this all this bunch of characters that uh, that they just lived with. Um, God, since uh, boy, it's uh, thirty years now. Thirty one. It's time to kill. It was nineteen eighty nine. Then I waited uh, twenty four years. Um, with Sycamore Road in two thousand thirteen to to bring them all back. And um, it, that book really was uh, kind of pleasantly surprised us at the popularity of uh, Jake and those characters. Jake primarily because of the success of A Time to Kill, but also the success of the movie. And, you know, Matthew McConaughey became a big star and did such a great job with the movie. And he also helped make Jake such a popular character. And, and we were really... Um, pleased with the way Sycamore Row was uh, received and the uh, sort of the, the market, the desire from a lot of readers to have more of Jake and Ford County and those characters. So after 2013, after Sycamore Row, I, I said, I'm not going to wait 24 more years to bring Jake back. So uh, I started looking around for a story and it took a while to find the right kind of story for Jake to handle in the courtroom and, and I found it right. to happen mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny when I'm, when I'm reading these books, I almost, but not quite picture Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> it's almost like he's kind of, kind of tall and skinny and, yeah. you know, looks a little rangy, but he's not quite Matthew McConaughey. I don't know. I don't know. He, but he's, <laughs> uh, he's a young man. I mean, this book, this new book takes place in 1990. So he's just like 37, I want to say. He's 37. Jake and I started together in 1985 when I started writing The Time to Kill. We were the same age. And uh, so I, obviously I have aged him slower than I'm aging myself because uh, I'm 65 now and Jake's only 37. The, time, this is the story of A Time to Kill took place in 1985, the trial of Carly Haley. Sycamore Row was two years later, 1987, and The Time for Mercy is 1990. So that's only a five year span over you know an actual 30 year career for me so jake jake is aging gracefully <laughs> well he's got some hard knocks along the way doesn't he yeah it, 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 physically literally and uh, emotionally in this in this story he uh he he's back with a very unpopular uh defendant in a small town and he is sort of forced to um defend Drew Gamble, a 16-year-old kid charged with murder. In a time to kill, Jake was desperate to get the case and keep the case of Carly Haley right. because he wanted, he wanted the big uh, courtroom showdown. He wanted, you know, he wanted to stake his claim as a trial lawyer 
uh, in those parts. And he didn't make any money off the case. And, and he, uh, he, was broke, he was broker after a time to kill them when he started. The uh, same is true now. Jake is still, you know, he, he has not attracted the type of uh, big time cases he dreams of. And we meet him at a time for mercy. He's still struggling, still doing the same thing in small town law practice and still trying to get, you know, better cases, better clients. And the bills are piling up on Jake. He's, uh, he's not going to make much money off this case either. And he, that's one reason he didn't want the case because it's capital murder. Those are incredibly uh, time intensive uh, cases that just eat up huge chunks of the clock. And, and he knows it. And uh, it's a very, you know, and the, the, the victim is a, a well-liked county deputy. Um, and uh, the town, once Jake takes this case and once he jumps in, you know, uh, and really comes to the defense of this kid, the town, um, as towns do, they turned on Jake. They turned away from him. And he went from being, you know, a popular young lawyer that everybody kind of trusted to uh, sort of an outcast. Yeah, and he doesn't stand to make a lot of money on it. It's like uh, no matter how many hours he builds, he's going to make $1,000, right? You know, that was the law in 1990. 1990 was the last year I practiced law. Uh, I practiced for 10 years, uh, very similar to Jake in a town like that. That's, that's why I you know, set the story there, the fictional place. Um, yeah. And believe it or not, in, in, in 1990, for a capital murder defense, a capital murder trial, uh, the state set the fees for court-appointed lawyers at two thousand dollars, which is um, uh, a joke. It's just a joke, and it was the law was uh, routinely criticized by judges, lawyers, everybody, but they wouldn't change it. And I'm, I'm not sure what it is now, but it's not much more than that now. Things are different now because they, they have they have like a statewide capital defense team that is funded better through the state, and these these guys go into small towns and defend people charged with the worst crimes and give them a fair trial. Uh, so right. it's a little bit different now, but in 1990, uh, when there was a serious crime in a lot of small towns, the local lawyers ran for cover like Jake wanted to. <laughs> he didn't want the case. Jake, uh, yeah, in the book, you know, it's like there's dozens and dozens of lawyers that just jump into the bushes to get away from this case. And Jake is just out like deer in the headlights. Uh, <laughs> he just can't say no to it. There was a case in 1984 that eventually inspired me to, to write uh, or start writing my first novel. And it was a terrible, terrible sexual assault case in our small town. And, oh gosh, uh, you know, for several days, we were all kind of dodging the phone. Nobody wanted to get, no lawyer wanted to get near the case because it was so toxic and ugly. And, and finally, a friend of mine from law school, a guy in my town, uh, kind of got stuck with the case and did the best he could with a terrible set of facts. Uh, but it was not something he wanted to do. But at the same time, if you're the lawyer, uh, you, you don't always get to choose your clients. Uh, you should be able to, but you don't always get to do that. And, and you have the ethical obligation to step up and do the best job you can. And it's, it's lawyers are really torn by that, especially for cases they don't want, but to be, to be required to go fight for someone who is, um, who's done terrible things is not, you know, you lose a lot of sleep over that. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. So once again, um, we have a book that opens up with a case of, of violence against children, essentially. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, that really, that really just heightens everything right from the beginning. It's a, it's a pretty dramatic opening. Uh, the kid, Drew Gamble, is a 16 year old kid who, um, his mother's 32, his, uh, Younger sister is 14. They've had a very, very hard life because their mother, Josie, a lady we get to know pretty well and it, 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 at times even admire, uh, she's had a hard life. She made bad decisions and she spent time in prison. The kids have been in foster homes, orphanages, uh, homeless. They've slept in cars, in campers. Uh, it's been a very hard life for these three people. And Josie, who's a, a fairly attractive young lady with a lot of miles on her. She, uh, she takes up with this deputy sheriff. Uh, there's a romance of sorts, uh, but primarily because he owns a house and she has a place, a roof with food to, for her kids to live in. 
and that's not a good situation. And it turns out that this guy, this deputy was, had a dark side that nobody knew about. It was really, uh, got ugly and it, the violence was terrible. The abuse was terrible. And finally one night, this is all the first chapter. So you know who kills who in the first chapter. Um, after a very bad night, uh, Drew got a gun and uh, pulled the trigger. Yeah, right. And now, you know, all of a sudden this kid, he's 16, but he looks 13. And he's um, accused of uh, first degree murder, capital crime. And there's the death penalty in Mississippi. In 1990, one reason I set the book in 1990 was because at that time, uh, it was not unusual for teenagers to be put on trial for capital murder in the death states, the death penalty states, um, and uh, treated like adults. And, um, and facing the death penalty and our life without parole or, you know, really harsh sentences for terrible crimes. Uh, and that has since been stopped by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, you, can, you cannot put a teenager on trial for capital murder, uh, nor can you sentence one to life without parole. Um, those decisions came down about 10 years ago. But it was not uncommon in 1990. That's one reason I set the book in 1990, was to take advantage of that period of time when it's, it's a very troubling uh, issue that I present in the book without really resolving the issue. I, I present the question because I don't have the answer. But what is the proper punishment for a 16-year-old kid like Drew who has been abused and is traumatized um, and he thinks he's acting in self-defense, uh, but he pulled the trigger. And for the victim and the victim's family, it doesn't matter who pulls the trigger. You know, the person is, you've lost a loved one, you lost a life and a loved one. And, and so it's got to be, punishment, uh, but what is the right punishment? I, I'm still struggling with that. And I may, I may go back, it, it, the issue fascinates me to a point to where I may go back again with another novel and explore that issue of, of what, what, what do you do with kids? What do you do with kids who commit horrible crimes? You know, I've, I've heard this said before that sometimes novelists will write novels because they're trying to figure out how they think about something and the only way to figure it out is to write about it. Uh, true. Uh, a lot of those issues, uh, some I've written about. Um, every book, uh, every book I write, I learn a lot. And that's, that's one reason I'm still fascinated by the process, because I can pick almost any subject I want to write about. Uh, obviously, the legal thrillers have to have that background. Uh, and that's what, I, that's what I know pretty well. That's what I enjoy reading and researching uh, books and article, articles about our criminal justice system, uh, but it's uh, every book is a learning experience for me, and I uh, I think I know how I feel when I start, uh, but I sometimes change or change a little bit, and um, that's called learning and living and researching, and uh, so so the, each each book is uh, is a wonderful adventure uh, for me as a writer, and and I I hope that comes across uh, to my readers. It, it, it does. As I was reading the new book, uh, Time for Mercy, I, you could just tell that you were just enjoying yourself as you wrote it. I'm sure that the process itself is kind of hard, but, but there's a certain enthusiasm for these characters and for the setting that really comes through. It's so true. Um, with these characters in that setting, it's, a, it's, it's home for me. It's where I'm from. It's, it's uh, where I grew up, where I practiced law for 10 years. I know the courts and the judges and the police and the sheriffs and um, that was very much a part of my daily life as a young lawyer and and, and I know the you know I know the culture I know the history the, the town the people their customs their uh, relig religion and politics and food and football and you know it's that's that's where I that's what I know that's where I'm from and so whenever I'm there uh, it's that's very natural and it's uh it's, it's much easier for me to write certain sections of the book. The, the legal issues are often uh, difficult and um, require uh, thought and research. And, and like I said a while ago, I mean, the, the issue here is something I didn't resolve um, because I've, I, I have not resolved it personally. And I'm still trying to do that uh, because it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very difficult issue when you're dealing with... Um, families and victims who have had their loved ones killed by teenagers who, and they, they want some severe punishment. They want, a lot of folks want the death penalty, you know, because 
their loved one is just as dead, regardless of the age of the killer. Uh, so it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough issue. It's very tough. Um, would you say, has your opinion overall on the death penalty changed over the years? very conservative, you know, deep south where um, the vast majority of the people uh, support the death penalty and still do, even though by lesser, by lesser numbers than 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, I, re I recall politicians, uh, some still do, but they campaign promising more, uh, you know, more executions, more, more people on death row to fight uh, serious crime. That's, that, that was the way I grew up. The old eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, Southern Baptist, conservative, religious uh, uh, beliefs, and and that's that's how I grew up, and and Jake too. And there's a scene in A Time to Kill when Jake is talking to uh, his law clerk, who is from Boston of all places, uh, you know, very liberal background, very liberal thought. She's in law school at Ole Miss of all places, and they have this pretty spirited discussion about the death penalty, and Jake's yeah. very much in favor of it, and. Um, for me, it changed uh, almost immediately one time, not too many years after uh, Time to Kill came out, I was um, on death row at the state penitentiary in Mississippi, uh, I, I researching a book called The Chamber. And I'd been there several times, uh, learning all I could about death row. And some of this research is depressing, but fascinating. I've, I've been to death row in probably half a dozen states. Um, and I, I was there many times at Parchment, Parchment Prison. And I'd, I'd talked to some of the men on death row. I'd talked to the guards, the, uh, the superintendents. I'd talked, to, uh, I'd talked to the executioner who mixed up the chemicals. Back then, it was the old death chamber, uh, gas chamber. There was nothing, this was before, uh, uh, before uh, the, the gas treatment, the, uh, the easier um, way of executing people. And, I actually sat in the in the gas chamber and they closed the door on me and uh, you know so my research was pretty pretty thorough and I was in the uh, I was in the uh, holding room one, late one afternoon uh, the holding room is a little, a little room next to the death room where the chamber is the gas chamber and um, I was talking to the chaplain about uh, what he goes through he, he the chaplain is the last person to talk to the uh, inmate before he goes into the gas chamber. His lawyers are gone. His family he's seen his family hours earlier, and he's had his last meal. And it's fascinating how each state has different rituals for those last terrible moments or hours. And and I, I was just talking to the chaplain about well, you know, what do you what do you say to a guy who's going to be dead in, in 30 minutes? And you know, yeah. he knows. And you know, that's a pretty pretty intense conversation. And uh, um, he said he asked me. He said. Um, he was a retired Southern Baptist preacher who was uh, a chaplain, a longtime chaplain at the state penitentiary. And he said, um, he asked me, he said, are you a Christian? And I said, I am. He said, do you think Jesus would condone what we do here, killing people? And um, I couldn't say yes. And I said, I don't think so. He said, I don't think so either. He said, this is not what Jesus taught. And he would not be proud of what we do. And at that moment, I said, you know, that's, that's true. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, if it's, he said, we can all agree that killing is wrong. And I said, yeah, we can all agree that that intentional killing is wrong. He said, so why does the state have the right to kill? And I said, I don't know. That shouldn't. So that's that's when I changed. Uh, in in the novel, in a time for mercy, Jake is confronted with his views about the death penalty uh, because I had to go back and clear that up. Uh, I had to go back and change that from earlier. And he's talking to his another another young law clerk about that. She says, "Why did why were you in favor of the death penalty?" And he said, "I was before Carly Haley, right, and, and representing him." You know, I could not see that guy going to be executed. I just could not believe that that was a possibility. And so that's when Jake changed too. He, do, he does evolve and learn over the years. He's still, he's still a very young man, even in a time for mercy. 
um, 37, as you said. Um, I, I hope to see him in a few more novels. <laughs> you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, the law clerk from A Time to Kill, Ellen Rourke, right? Or Roark, as they call Roark, her. Yeah. I keep waiting for her to come back, but we haven't seen her. Yeah, that, she's probably gone. She, her wow. father was a uh, well-known criminal lawyer in Boston and uh, uh, almost a kind, of, a, kind of like a radical trial lawyer. That, you know, she, she grew up with a very different belief system than what she found in Mississippi. And, she yeah. was a good character for a while, but I doubt if she's going to be back. The, the character I, I'm really intrigued with now is Curry's current law clerk, uh, Portia Lane, is Portia, a uh, no. local girl, African-American girl, who, who fled town by joining the Army, and she came back, and we met her in uh, Sycamore Row a little bit. She's, yeah. she's been working for Jake for two or three years now, and she, um, she's about to leave to go to law school, and her dream is to return to Clanton and become the first African-American female uh, lawyer in town and to work for her people. That's what she is called to do. And Jake has basically offered her a job <laughs> with him. And, and you know, there, there's a good story somewhere there with Portia. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to read that one. <laughs> so you, um, it struck me as, uh, as I was rereading over the weekend, um, Sycamore Row, and I went back to a time to kill um, for the first time in some years. And um, in in the New York Times in June, there was a there was a story that said um, every work of American literature is about race. And I said, well, that might be an exaggeration, but but there's some truth to it. I mean, race is like the great unresolved conflict um, throughout our history, and it's come to the fore certainly this year. And you've pretty much always been writing about it. Um, how have your views evolved over the years and what do you think about the present moment? I know that's a big question. Uh, well, the evolution is uh, still happening. Um, the evolution is um, uh, dramatic because of the way I was raised and grew up in a white world. Uh, it was all white. My little section of the town was all white, uh, white schools, white churches, white neighborhoods, uh, with the very strong belief and desire and power to keep it that way. Yep. And to enforce Jim Crow, to keep black people down, to deny them basic rights, uh, that's that's how I grew up. That was that's almost in my DNA, yeah. and uh, it's still. And, but because of that, I know that people can change. And um, it took me a while growing up and being able to look at issues differently and meeting, uh, you know, black people who became friends. And you know, uh, so the evolution, uh, you know, has been very dramatic and. Looking at it now, I, I, I don't know, uh, I, I wouldn't say every work of literature is about race. Um, I'm not sure that includes popular fiction. Maybe, maybe, maybe literary works, maybe, I don't know. I don't write that stuff. <laughs> I stay away from that. I write the popular stuff. Uh, but so much of what we do goes back to race. Um, it's always going to be complicated because race is our, uh, I mean, slavery is our country's greatest sin and wrongdoing and we're still we're still grappling with it today and, and until until white people can look at black people with some degree of um, empathy and understanding for what they've been through and where they come from and and what they've been subjected to by centuries of um, uh, being powerless and poor and and uh, you know without rights uh, I'm not sure much is going to change. You know, we, we've got to confront what has happened, what did happen. Uh, slavery is barely taught in schools. You know, we, we brush it aside and say, well, you know, it happened. Well, but the, the legacy of slavery is still around. And uh, we, you know, we don't want to talk about that. But I, I, think, I think we are. I think we're confronting a lot of it now because of what's happened this year. Uh, the protests are, it seems like this moment is different because of the shootings and because of the protests and because people are, are 
you know, at least wanting to talk about it. We, we were hoping that um, before 2016, there was, there was um, quite a bit of movement toward the middle on criminal justice reform and changing some laws that lead to uh, mass incarceration. Some of these ridiculous laws we have on the books that three strikes you're out, we put people in prison for 20 years for writing the third bad check. You know, all these stupid fel felonies, these really uh, arcane and draconian laws that we have passed over the years trying to fight crime. Uh, you know, we, if we could decriminalize uh, some of the drug charges in this country and, and not make punishments so severe, anyway, we, if we could change a lot of things. Uh, so there, there was, there was a lot of talk about criminal justice reform and again, changing some of the laws that would, the way we do things that would take a huge burden off of poor people and minorities. Um, that pretty much went out the window in 2016 uh, when, you know, the, the regime changed and uh, Jeff Sessions as attorney general had no interest whatsoever in criminal justice reform. And he killed all of initiatives back then you know, quickly. And so, uh, if, if there's a change uh, in January, uh, some of, you know, a lot of people are optimistic that we can at least start changing some of these laws that, that lead to so much incarceration and lifetime felony convictions. If, you know, you, cannot, you, can't, you can't discriminate against a person anymore because they're black. But if they're a convicted felon, they're going to face a lifetime of uh, discrimination because of that and denial of benefits and employment and all that. Uh, so mass incarceration in many, many ways is, is just another term for Jim Crow. Uh, let's label people and, and stigmatize them and, and mistreat them. And they, we, we, we can just stop arresting and convicting so many people for nonviolent crimes. Uh, that would be a huge step in the right direction. I, I would like to, um, I'd like to have a seat at the table uh, somewhere and, and help work for criminal justice reform. I can write about it, which I'm doing. Uh, and I have, you know, I have a nice audience and people, uh, I think become more aware, aware of wrongful convictions. Uh, there's so many of those mass incarcerations, sentencing disparities, juvenile justice system is a mess. Oh uh, yeah, I could go on and on, but, uh, you know, we, I'm, I'm a little bit optimistic that we might start addressing some of these laws. I hope so. I mean, you have a powerful voice and I think, I know it would be heard. I mean, you mentioned that you just write popular fiction, but look, it's popular for a reason. I mean, you, you, you confront important themes head on and you make them entertaining and you make people read about them. And it's a, it's, it's, um, it's an incredible gift Thank that you. you have to be a best-selling storyteller and still tackle these important themes at the same time and make people think about them and you don't flinch away from them. You know, I just thank admire that a lot. Well, th thank you for that. I, 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 um, I talk about race bluntly uh, because a lot of people don't want to talk about it that way. It's, but there needs to be frank discussions uh, at so many different levels uh, to, to start addressing some of, the, some, of the, some of the roots of the problems are, again, laws that we have that are just um, archaic. And, and so severe and, and un, un, this is a hard country. Um, I mean, people, we, we have people who serve their time in prison. You know, they did the crime, they served the time, they, they, we can't get them paroled. Uh, parole boards don't want to release, you know, criminals. Well, they're supposed to after you serve your time or, or serve enough of your sentence. Uh, but, you know, we have a huge parole problem in this country. And we have two and a half million people in prison, first of all, and it's extremely expensive. Uh, and it just crushes uh, families and people who never recover. Uh, so anyway, that's, really that's, my, that's my next soapbox. I, I got a lot of soapboxes, Michael. <laughs> I, lo I love the soapboxes. I get on them occasionally myself. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, let me just, um, let's take a look. Here's one from, uh, some, uh, from Charlie Cow. It's Mr. Grisham, sorry, John. I've always wondered what happened to Mitch McDeer. Any ideas? The Chamber is my favorite book of yours, says Charlie. Uh, well, thank you, Charles. Uh, the Chamber was uh, uh, probably the most difficult book to write uh, because it was 1994 
and I was still kind of a rookie and um, still struggling with, uh, you know, some of my own beliefs and thoughts. And, and it was a fascinating period of time that is portrayed in the story because it's true in 1969, the Klan in Mississippi decided to go after the Jews and there weren't many of them. They, there were about 3000 Jews in the whole state and the Klan blamed the Jews for, uh, you know, stirring up the civil rights stuff and bringing in radical lawyers to register people to vote. So the Klan started bombing synagogues and homes and, and, <laughs> But most Jews in Mississippi are thoroughly assimilated. Uh, many have been elected to office. We, you know, we never thought about uh, that. That issue never bothered us. Bothered the Klan, and so they bombed uh, you know, some buildings. And it was an orchestrated effort to intimidate Jewish people in Mississippi. It's a fascinating period of time, and that's what the chamber is about. A, a, a Klansman who, you know, built some bombs and killed some people. He's on death row and. It, it, I was fascinated by the story, but it was difficult to uh, it was difficult to get the guy to death row. Finally, uh, I just never could quite kill him off in time. So it, the book the book dragged on. Mitch McDeer is gone. I'm not sure we can ever bring him back. Uh, we they, they tried a TV series five or six years ago. Um, they the idea was to bring Mitch back ten years after the firm to see what he's doing. And I said, okay, try it. You know, I, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, I thought it was kind of fun to see what could happen. And, and nothing happened. Nobody watched the show and it went away. So I'm not sure I'm, not sure I'm going to bring Mitch back. Mitch was uh, 30, almost 30 years ago. Oh, poor Mitch. Well, anyway, here's another question. Um, and we actually, there are two questions that sort of related. So let me ask them both at the same time. One is, why did you only practice law for 10 years? And the other is, is there a case that still bothers you from when you practice law? That's a great question because in the time for mercy, there's a civil case that's on a parallel track with the criminal case, Jake's case. It's a railroad collision uh, at a rural crossing late at night, dangerous crossing, and a young family is killed instantly by the train. And I had a case very similar, uh, almost fresh out of law school. I got this case and it was um, going to be a big case. It was going to make my career. I was going to take it all the way to trial in federal court and um, get a big verdict, make a bunch of money and kind of stake my claim as, you know, a young hotshot lawyer. That was, my, that was my dream. And I was ambitious enough to try to do it. And um, I won't go into the whole story, but suffice to say that I worked on the case so much, so many hours that I discovered things that I did not want to know about the case. And I, I was supposed to divulge all the information I knew, okay? And I didn't do that. And that was 35 years ago. And uh, obviously it bothers me because I wrote about it. I put it in time for mercy you'll 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 see what happens when you get there uh so that that still bothers me a little bit it's been a long time the case was settled after three days of trial everybody was happy so it was a happy ending uh, certainly for me i made some money off the case uh i practiced for 10 years only because about halfway through that career there was a lot of frustration uh, still is in, in being a small town lawyer it's kind of tough to to do well financially because there's so much competition. And, and about halfway through that career, I started writing A Time to Kill. And after I'd written for a year or so, I realized that I, I loved the story and I was gonna finish the book. So I started thinking about how great it would be uh, not to have to go to the law office and deal with angry clients and not to answer the phone 12 hours a day, all that kind of stuff just to be able to sit back and write full time. And so the, the dream of writing full time uh, just almost killed my motivation to, to, be a, to be a lawyer for the rest of my career. It was, it was a dream, it was, it was a wild dream, but it's still a pretty powerful dream. And I reached a point with the firm and after 10 years where I could get up and walk out of the office and never look back and that's what I did. 
you looked back once though, didn't you go back and get a, a nice settlement um, back like in the mid nineties? Yeah, we, uh, right before the firm came out in March of 1991, a friend of mine, uh, I had just closed my law office about two months later, a friend of mine brought me another great case involving a railroad. Yeah. And I signed the case up thinking that we would just settle it would go away. And four years passed. And I, you know, all, all these other things were happening to me, the firm, the Pelican Bay, the client, the movies. I, you know, I, I wanted that case to go away. And finally the judge said it's time for a trial. And I had to go back to a small town in South Mississippi in January of 1996 and try this case. And uh, we got a nice verdict. The jury was happy. We, I mean, the family was happy. Uh, we settled the case right after the trial and everybody was thrilled. And I, I was the happiest guy in the world. And I walked out of the courtroom and I said to myself, I will never ever voluntarily enter another courtroom in my, in my life. I, I played my last court. <laughs> but that has not been true. I, I go to a lot of courtrooms to do research. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. So when you impaneled that jury in 1996, was was there a jury? Did did any did the judge say? Does anybody know who Mr. Grisham is? He's uh, Have you read his books? Or? You know what? It was just after the O.J. Simpson trial, um, and so there was a lot of media interest in you know sensational trials or or big 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 name trials. And yeah, we had a lot of press there. The first day of the trial. Uh, a lot of far too much of it and it was kind of funny most civil trials are pretty dull and um most criminal trials are pretty dull too in fact the hard thing to do as a writer when you're writing courtroom stuff is to to keep it short and you know dramatic and make it move because it, things just don't go that fast and you'll bore your reader and so it was so funny after the first day of trial when, when the trial started we had a bunch of cameras and all that not in the courtroom, but uh, around and a lot of media. <laughs> and after the first day of trial, they were all asleep. By the second day of the trial, they were all gone. They just know everybody disappeared. It was just not that, it was not O.J. Simpson, okay? It was not that sexy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, but we, we dealt with it. The judge instructed the jury, uh, you, know, you know, Mr. Grisham was here not as a writer. We're all proud of him because he's from Mississippi, but let's put that aside right now and, and stick with the facts. And I even touched on that, you know, in my opening statement. I said, okay, look, you know, I'm sure all of you folks have read all my books. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure you've all read them all. Let's forget about that for the next three days because I want to try this case. We're going to put on facts and witnesses and let's, let's give both sides a fair trial. So we did a good job of, you know, of, of, of talking our way through it. Yeah. That's like in the, in the new book, um, you know, the, uh, Lawyers will stand up and say, well, I'm sure 100 percent of you voted for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the DA always says, because he's elected. He says, you know, I'm not going to ask for you. You, you. you got the whole panel. He's got 100 potential jurors. And he's going to say, uh, I haven't met all you folks. I'm sure all of you voted for me. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty <laughs> common in the Deep South. Yeah. So uh, we've got a lot of questions in the chat about uh, do, are you planning to write any prequels or sequels to any of the novels that they've, that they've really loved in the past? You know, Michael, I've learned um, uh, a little bit along the way. Um, I've learned not to predict what might come up next year or the following year. Um, there are two, there are three examples. Camino Island, uh, was followed by Camino Winds. There will be a third Camino book next couple of years. It's under contract. I think I have the story for it. And it's, again, th these are beach books. There's no, uh, there are no lawyers, no issues. They're kind of mysteries, just fun uh, summer books. And I, they're so much fun to write. And I really, by the time I finished the first one, Camino Island, I really liked the setting and the characters. And so uh, Camino Winds was sort of, sort of a follow-up, not a sequel. Uh, and then Camino, the third Camino will be along the same lines. Uh, it's about a bookstore and writers and you know, things like that. Um, I wrote a book called The Whistler. It came out in 2016, just a few years ago. It involved a young a lady named Lacey Stoltz, who's a lawyer. Her job is to investigate complaints against uh, judges for wrongdoing. And um, she would be easy to bring back with another big case involving a, you know, a corrupt judge or some scam that she gets into. 
There's a book called Gray Mountain that came out about seven years ago. It involves a young uh, female lawyer from a big hotshot Wall Street firm who gets furloughed with the uh, recession of 2008. This really happened. These law firms laid off hundreds of associates. And she found herself in Appalachia at a legal uh, aid clinic uh, working with people, poor people who didn't have any money but had real cases. And when the story was over, she's still there and she's debating about whether or not to go back to New York to a job she doesn't want uh, or to stay where she is and represent real people. So that would be easy to go back to that one too. Most yeah. of them do not lend themselves to follow-ups or sequels. So, um, so I, 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 for the most part, the answer is no, but, but again, you just never know. You never know, do you? Yeah, no. that's, that's good. So uh, we have just a few minutes left, um, and we have uh, so your reader's undivided attention for two and a half minutes. Anything you want to tell them as a closing, closing comment? Uh, you know, every chance I get, I always say thanks. Thanks to um, the people who uh, buy the books, read the books, uh, the loyal fans who have been around for 30 years now. And, um, you know, I sure don't take you for granted. Uh, when, I, when I start a book, I'll start the next book in January. And um, I go through this process of planning the book and thinking about it for a long time. And my goal is to make it the best book I've ever written because I want, you know, I want to deliver uh, that to the readers every time because the readers deserve it. They've been loyal for many, many years. And, and so I always say thanks to the readers. I always say thanks to independent bookstores because when A Time to Kill was published in 1989, I was unknown. My publisher was small, unknown. And I didn't have a clout to get in uh, big bookstores, big chains. Uh, you know, I just didn't have the muscle or name or whatever. And there were uh, a handful of independents who uh, welcomed me with open arms and had big signings, big book parties, and moved a lot of books for me. And then when the firm came out, it was a different story. 18 months later, suddenly, you know, I was in demand. I didn't want to go all over the country. I went back to those initial bookstores and have been going back ever since. But the independent bookstores, back then, 30 years ago, they were crucial to the uh, success of so many debut authors because they, you guys read, you know books, your staff is, uh, is informed, your staff can rec recommend books, you, you love to have the book parties and signings, and that's what, the, you know, a lot of, a lot of nostalgia from uh, the old book tours, you know, and so I'll always have a, a, a lot of loyalty to uh, the indies, so support your independent bookstore. Thank you, well, boy, I can't think of a better note to, to end on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John Grisham, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have signed copies of A Time for Mercy here available at Gibson's Bookstore. And uh, it's just been such a great pleasure to talk with you today. I want to come see you non-virtually, okay? We have a real book signing. A real I, book. I, I, I'm going to hold you to that, sir. I hope. <laughs> well, when or when? <laughs> we, we hope soon. <laughs> thank you, Michael. You guys take care. Be safe. Thank, thank you so much. You too. And thanks to everybody for joining us today.